Michael can pass. Oh, Michael. Oh, what he needs. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. To see Katie Smith get baptized. Katie Reynolds. Hallelujah. That's an old youth pastor. Watching and witnessing God's hand upon lives and knowing that you're only inserted for a time and that this really all belongs to him. This is his work. This is his handiwork. And if he chooses to work in you and work through you, hallelujah. I heard Josh preached on that last week, and I listened to his message, and it was tremendous. While I'm sorting out my papers, I figure that maybe I'll get all these notes together and not need them anyway, because Katie Adams and Michael Borden already preached a great message of what I'm going to speak about. We're headed into a new series. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians, and so that's why I did have you turn there. You thought I might have been joking. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 to start out with, and then we're going to head in a little bit to chapter number 13, and then we'll even look at the book of Acts and the start of this church and how it got started, and we're really going to just introduce our study today. You know, we've had some... Uh, neat things go on in our ministry over the last two, three, four months, and of course, celebrating the 25th anniversary was just absolutely tremendous. Uh, I thank the Lord for all of the celebration and all that was involved in that, seeing some, some uh, young people get baptized, a young little girl get baptized by her grandpa, that's pretty cool, and just to just to hear that Michael got saved and he knows that he is without question that Katie in her life of struggles now truly is born again. She's saved. And gosh, I, where, I saw a bunch of the family here. Where did you go? Did you? Oh, there you are. Hallelujah, Susie. Hallelujah, Ray and Tammy. Michael Borden singing at the choir at his little church at Recovery. <laughs> Hallelujah. Nothing like a redeemed soul and a changed heart that has the song of Jesus Christ. Remember when you got saved? It ought to be that way all the time. We have a life that's been given to us by Jesus that's more abundant. And it's eternal from the moment of your salvation. I preached on that a couple weeks ago. And here we are walking into a new series, Love Never Fails. And really, when you heard a couple of those testimonies, your love for your son never failed. Because that love that you gave him was God's love. Your love for your daughter. And that lady's love in her life, never failed. It never failed. You see, the failing that comes in the way that we ended up witness, end up witnessing that comes about because we, of course, want to do love the way that uh, we translate it from, say, decades before, maybe the way we were raised, maybe the relationships that we've already had when Jesus says, I'll impart in you, I'll put in you, I will sanctify you, I will change you by my word, by my living word, by all that I am, I will, learn, I will have you learn how to know this love that came from God and you and I have to give to others. Love never fails. A f two years ago, I think, over a little over two years ago, maybe I introduced to you, church, the Acts 2 project, and I shared with you how, hey, as we have been this church for 20-something years and what God's done being an Acts 1-8 church, it's been a missions church for so many years, all the years, 
and really looking at how we wanted to refine our vision and, and uh, refine our mission to see that this vision would really take hold. If you have any of those handouts, and some of you have those calendar handouts, right on the front cover it says 25th anniversary, and the back it has the holy calling, but then it says right there in, in big letters, live faith, love others, declare hope, live faith, love others, declare hope. And so a couple years back, we got into the first part of that vision renewed and refreshed and said, okay, let's look at faith. And we did a study through the book of Galatians. We've done some other studies since then. And as God has really just kind of prompted me and, and pushed me, I said, okay, God, what's next? Well, it has to be somewhere in this place of love. And as the first of the year started and we're off of the holy calling theme and working through that, I'm saying, okay, God, we're finishing up our study in Ecclesiastes. We looked at a study in a, in a short series, a topical series, Be Better. I've been praying through this. Okay, God, what New Testament letter could really capture? It could be this one, could be that one. And praying through it, and God just landed me in 1 Corinthians about two to three months ago. And I see where love others is really profound and very, very strong. And it is one of the themes that could be pulled out of. And so this is where God landed me in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Go there for a moment as we just kind of highlight this. We'll come back to it. And when we have our study chapter by chapter and verse by verse, we'll get into it a little deeper. But I want you to really capture now this live faith, love others, declare hope, moves to love never fails. Well, where did that come from? How does that come out? Well, I think we need to define some things by the word of God. And again, when you see that artwork up on there, love never fails. You say, okay, yeah, it's charity never faileth, but whatever. Let's watch this and see how the word of God defines itself. Let's see how God defines his words, how the translators use the word that they used, and I pray that you will just kind of hear the teaching of God's word today from the Holy Spirit of really how this lands. You see, our purpose is to love others, and that's part of our purpose. It is, of course, live out faith and, and to declare hope. We're missions, family, sports, and to see how God can work through all of that, you say, okay, why do you do what you do? Well, it should fit in all of that. Well, when do you do, and how do you do, and what do you do? It should all fit in your purpose for the church. And it says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, I hope you're there, just pick up with me in verse number 4 if you would. And I just want to read a little bit down to verse 8 and give you some context of where we landed with Love Never Fails and highlight verse number eight. Verse four says, charity suffereth long. It is kind and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So you have one, two things that are on the positive. This is what charity does. And then you have some where it says, charity doesn't do this stuff. God is defining for us what charity truly is. Verse number five, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That's charity. That's the love that never fails. Verse number eight, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. This divine wisdom from Paul that comes in this passage is really maybe how you could say, okay, 1 Corinthians should be a series on wisdom. Well, sure it does. And sure it could be. It could be a, a series called How to Deal with Problems in the Church. Okay, sure it could. It could be called a, a lot of different things in its series. But Paul is imparting wisdom into this church because they're confounded by their own worldly, fleshly wisdom and devilish wisdom. And it's, so it's conflicted in all kinds of doctrine, all kinds of theology. But most of all, it's conflicted in what is the best thing. What is the most important thing? 
verse number tw uh, 31 in chapter number 12. Look at it, just, just right before it, just right before this. It says, verse number 31, chapter 12, 1 Corinthians, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So here we have Paul, chapter number 12, saying, hey, here's what the spiritual gifts are all about. Chapter number 14, here is how you will pervert them and how you have been perverting them and how you need to straighten them out. So chapter 12, purpose, all the ways it lines up. These are the spirit gifts that you can really adapt, I mean, uh, tap into from the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter number 14, you see where, wait a minute, they messed them all up. They made a mess out of them all. So a purpose and a perversion of the spirit gifts. In between those two chapters, God says, let me have you insert chapter 13, a more excellent way. Wow. And there you're off and running in verse number one, verse number two, verse number three, verse number four. You're going, whoa. The more excellent way is charity? It's this love, this agape love? Yes, it is. You see, this church is getting started. This church is getting going. It's the early first century. It's after, of course, Jesus has gone to the cross, raised from the dead. He's appeared to over four, 540 days. He has appeared to the disciples, the apostles. He said, hey, this is the work you got to do. And by the way, he appeared to a guy named Saul, too, on the road to Damascus. And as Paul writes all this because he learns of this incredible love of the Lord... And he realizes this church, which is started in 51, 52 AD, 50, right around that time in the early 50s, and he is the one who's the church plant that started it. He's saying, hey, this is really important. In fact, it's a more excellent way, this kind of love that I'm talking about. So does the Bible really define this kind of love? Well, I've always used the old Noah Webster dictionary. I've used the old concordance. I don't know what else to use. So when I look at Noah Webster's dictionary, it says in a general sense, from back then, 1828, in the Old English, love, benevolence, and goodwill. If you said the word charity to a lot of people today, they would think, oh, you have a charity, you have a 501c3, does anybody give you any money for it? <laughs> you must have a great charity if you have a lot of money. That's not what the word is translated and means in the Greek in the New Testament. You see, when it's, when it's used here, it's shown in us that it's a very, very powerful and very, very important word. When you look it up in your concordance, you find out agape. Agape from G25, which is agapape, agape, which is another extension of agape love of G25. So G26 is really this charity, this love, affection, benevolence, especially a love feast. It's charity or charitably, charitably, dear in love. Where does this love come from? Yes, it comes from God. Why in this book did God insert it in there? Why did God put so much emphasis in this church at Corinth? We'll see that here when we look at the background of this church and this letter. You see, when we look at this, we go, okay, now, gosh, I don't know how this would apply to us. I mean, that... That letter was written back in 56, 58 AD, a few years after the church was started. Well, the church was started by Paul, leading people to Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel. People came to know him. People were discipled. He taught them, and yet they lost their way. They lost their way on doctrine. They lost their way on theology. They lost their way on so many things. And one of the biggest things is they lost their way in love. You see, love never fails. Charity suffereth long and is kind. When you look at that, you say, charity, is it really? Yes. And that older word still applies today. And when we look at the meaning of the word, you say, oh my, is that really true? Yes. Yes, the word of God. As it is translated, and as you have this King James Bible on your lap, and they brought it from the Greek to the English, and this agape word was used, they say, well, you had to sort out which love it is every time it was brought up. Is it eros? Is it philia? Is it some other kind of love? But there's enough verses here to tell me that God really had a purpose in this kind of love. 
You see, there are lots of verses. It's mentioned 28 times in your New Testament that use this love, this love in the charity translation. It denotes this agape love, this affection from God and that God has toward us so that when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the fruit of the Spirit begins to birth itself because now you have the Holy Spirit of God in you. That's got to be the greatest difference in your life, Michael, is you know that the God of the universe is inside. You know he's there. There's no more doubt, is there? And that's the difference. The Spirit of God comes to live in you. If you're wondering whether you're saved or not, if he ain't in there, you ain't saved. And it's nothing you can do to will him in there. You would bow your knee and bow your heart and humble yourself before God and say, I am a sinner and I need the Savior. And he's the only one that can save me. And when you call on the name of the Lord to save you, and you really mean it, and you say, I'm not going that way no more, I'm going your way, I'm putting it all down. He'll come in. And this new life begins, and one of the big pieces of it is this love. The scriptures are filled with it. When I spoke last time, a couple of Sundays ago, I mentioned this prayer in John 17. Well, one of the verses I want you to see is the last verse of Jesus' prayer in the prayer before the garden. Some would call it the prayer in the upper room. Some would say that he was praying as he was on his way to the garden. But it says in John 17, verse 26, And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love, G26, wherewith thou hast loved me, may be in them and I in them. At salvation, Jesus is saying that your new life begun in that moment. Eternal life started, and this life, this new life, Jesus is praying this, that the love wherewith thou loved me may be in them, and I in them. All the disciples, all the apostles, and all those after those that got saved, I pray that prayer upon them. That is the word, agape, translated love right there. There's more. You need a know a little bit about this Roman stuff, watch this. Paul the Apostle in the, the letter to the Romans, Romans 5.5, 5, and hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Some of you know that verse. Maybe some of you have memorized that verse. Look at this. Because the love of God, G26, agape, this love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. When you get saved, that's what I was just saying. You Receive that love of God. I don't know what to do with that love. Just keep on asking for more of it. Get in the word of God. Read and tell him you love him and have him show you more of that. And his love will come on inside of you in a deeper way. It'll get deeper. It'll get just more of you will go away and more of his love will appear. People will say, wow. I've never seen you act this way. I've never seen you love like this. That's just him. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 says, But God commended his love, G26, toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is where this appears. It appears in John's gospel. It appears in the book of Romans. It appears in some other places. You think, wow. How about this one? You know Romans 8, 39. Neither height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What you're saying, Pastor, then is that it's just the love of God. And so if I could just attach to the love of God and just say, hey, I know about the love of God. No, it moves from the place of divine heavenlies through the gospel, through the word of God by the Holy Spirit. And it comes and it, bur- it just bursts and grows in you if you just let it. How can you possibly recompense something good for something bad? How can you say, I do not have to recompense evil for evil? That's God's love in you acting it out. How can you forgive someone that seemingly comes up against you? It's the love of God 
Where is the love of God? In the Corinthian church, it took a break for a lot of years. Is it possible it has taken a break in the body of Christ and the God's church? I think it may have. A lot of you know this love. And you want more of it. Because when you have this love and it gets deeper in you, you just can't get enough of it. Whoo! When Katie's talking about that woman, that's the love she witnessed. That's the love. It says in Romans chapter number 12, verse number 9, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. That's this kind of love right here. Let love be without dissimulation. Woo! Romans 13, 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Because Christ fulfilled all the law. How is it that we can walk so quickly away from and stay so far away from the beautiful truth of God's love for us that we are able to tap into to then have for others? You see, the greatest place that it ought to exist is here, together with each other, to say, I love you and I mean it. 1 Corinthians 8 says, Now is touching things offered unto idols. We know that all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You want to build somebody up? That's where it's coming from. You see, it moved from this love of God or God's love in G26 to G26 still saying it's the love of the neighbor. It's the love of others. It's for us to love one another as we love ourselves. You say, ah, it's just another love, love message. Ooh, I feel bad if you think that way. Turn to Acts chapter number 18. Because when you see up on the screen there, love never fails. You're wondering, is it really true? Has it really played out? And you know one thing that's going to carry you through every single thing that you're going through? Every single thing. God's love in you. And you loving like God's love is in you. It has taken me through everything. And it's still that. And I need more of that. We need more of that. Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friend. You know, that's a G26. That's agape right there. Jesus said that himself to his disciples. How about this one that we quote? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have a love, G26, one for another. That's the same agape word. 28 times the translators chose to use it, put charity or love there, same root word. I guess love never fails. Charity never faileth. But if I got all this other stuff, we'll get there sooner or later in our study to break down every piece and part of that. When you turn to Acts 18 now, just this part of the message real quick for just the next few minutes, let me just give you, first of all, a little background of the church. Secondly, a little bit of an introduction to this letter. And third of all, just a thought on why we're doing and how we're going to go about this message. Background of the church, if you would be so kind, follow along with me in Acts 18, verse number 1. Paul is heading off to this place called Corinth. Corinth is at this time the present day capital. And you say, well, is it really that big of a deal, this place? Oh, yes it is. You see, there's Athens around and things like that, but Corinth is the capital. 
it is said that captains would choose to carry their ships over land on rollers. You're talking almost 2,000 years ago, just so they could get through there. The procedure was quicker and safer, and it saved 250 miles. Corinth became a major trade center in those days. This place was huge and so important, and Paul has selected it by the Holy Spirit's leading as one of his stop-off points. Here he is in his missionary journey, and he's in Acts chapter 18, verse number 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus lately, came from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So they had a camaraderie already built in with their vocation. It says in verse number 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. And while Silas and Tim Timotheus were come from Macedonia to come hang out, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Remember this. Keep in mind that Paul went to that temple to find people that wanted to hear about God. He also had a big burden for his, his uh, Jewish heritage people. He wanted them to know Jesus Christ. They wanted him to know, them to know that Jesus is the Christ. And you see him with this incredible agape love for people. But the deepest part of his love shown from God on high is his love for his brothers and sisters in the Lord. Because it gets deeper and deeper, stronger and stronger, as he's witnessing and testifying to these Jews that are saying, no, Jesus, no, Jesus, no, I do, I'm going to say no to Jesus. What does it say in verse number six? And when they opposed themselves, they blasphemed. He shook his raiment, said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth, I will go into the Gentiles. Wow. A declarative from Paul that he already was called to them, but now he's speaking it because he still goes to witness to them in the temple of every, the synagogue of every city he's going into. And yet he's saying, oh, can't do this. Going to the Gentiles. Verse number seven. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshiped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his house. Wow, there's people coming to Jesus at Corinth. It's really, really neat. And the people in the temple are not very happy. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. That was free of charge, my nice voice. So you've got this whole package going on. The enthusiasm, the excitement. Paul's preaching it. What happens in verse number 9? <laughs> the Lord spake to Paul in the night by a vision. Watch out. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. There's so much that's going to happen. So many people are going to come to Jesus Christ. So many people are going to say, this church is going to be just really incredible. You don't know yet, Paul. You just keep on doing what I told you to do, and no one's going to hurt you. No one's going to take you out. Not until my say so, just like for my son Jesus Christ. Verse number 11 says, and he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. What a great testimony of Paul the Apostle in the background of this church. He has such a resolution. He was resolved. And even when they opposed themselves, the Jews, he shook his raiment, he put it down, and he said, you know what? Your blood will be upon your own heads. Just as it says in Acts 20, verse 26, wherefore I take to you, excuse me, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Can I say that about my testimony? Am I pure? Have I witnessed to everyone that I was supposed to witness to? Have I had this desire to reason with people, as it says in verse number four, instead of just flippantly saying, hey, you're going to hell if you don't get saved and walk away from them, instead of reasoning with them and saying, Michael, do you think maybe it's your salvation? Maybe are you saved? Do you know? 
reason. Talk. I'll finish out verse 12 through 17. Here's the background here. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. So, Jesus, so the Lord let him know ahead of time because of his preaching about Jesus, he's going to get it. He's going to get it. And he didn't stop. Verse 13 says, saying, this fellow persuaded men to worship God contrary to law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, or ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it. For I will know, I will be no judge of such matters. He said, I don't want to have nothing to do with this hypocrisy. Just like the same rotten council that murdered Jesus Christ and then brought false accusation after false accusation after false accusation. This is what they're doing to Paul. And his love remains. His incredible love remains. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Who is that? Gallio. Verse 17, then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. You know why they beat him there? Because if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, you find out that he's a brother in the Lord with Paul. He became a believer too, and they weren't happy with him. Whew. Think about this. In the background of this church and how it got started, it was powerful, it was incredible. Christmas, the tree the ruler, his family believed, they got baptized and with many Corinthian people. <laughs> this must have been incredible for the Corinthian church getting to be birthed, but the Jews are probably going, ah! Paul's uncommon faith, Paul's agape love for his brethren and his brokenness still for lost Israel. So let me just introduce to you the book of 1 Corinthians really fast. It'll take me just a couple minutes. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. I just want to introduce a couple of principles of how this letter came about, how this letter came to be, how this one we have here. I've got some addresses up there. 1 Corinthians 1 verse number 11. You see, there's the background of how the church got started. God led Paul the apostle, bam, preaching the word, Reasoning with people, souls being saved. He stayed there for 18 months, it says, and taught the Bible. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you, I am of Paul, I am Apollos, I am Cephas, and I, have, I of Christ. Is Christ divided? No, it's just Jesus. It's always just Jesus. Was Paul crucified for you, or were you, or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? These young people, Grandpa, Bobby, you baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name of Jesus. That's who saves, that's who we have baptisms in the name of. When you think about this book of 1 Corinthians, there's things going on. Verse number 11 tells you, it's been declared unto me, my brethren. So somebody by the house of Chloe has gone and sent a report to Paul. Paul left Corinth and went to Ephesus. He was at Ephesus for a long time. He wrote this letter back to them from Ephesus. What else happened? 1 Corinthians 5.9. When you look there, you say, okay, what else points to this letter? It says in verse number 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. It says that he wrote a letter already. Now, some Bible people would say, well, yeah, he wrote a letter, but that's what it says. We don't have any record of it, so he probably didn't or it got lost. No. To me, I see that God put it in his word that he wrote a letter. So God's not a liar. So that letter went to them. So there was a letter before, but God chose not to put it in his Bible. That's fine. God can do whatever he wants. So that first letter he wrote said, hey, stop messing around with sexual sin. 
chapter number five, chapter number six. We'll get into that thing when we study through the word. I already wrote you a note, probably a shorter letter, I would think. I'm just making an assumption. But you're saying, okay, how does this come about, this letter here, this big one? Well, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. I'm glad you asked, which you didn't. So I will just assume that you're thinking that. 1 Corinthians 16. So here he is finishing up the letter, and you say, how in the world did this come to be? Well, church gets started, spends 18 months, things are cranking, goes off to Ephesus. He's down in Ephesus. Church gets started. Everything gets going. Discipling, church, wow, incredible. Here's things about the church at Corinth. They weren't even that old. The church is hardly a few years old. I really believe that this letter should be taught every 10, 12 years, 14 years in the church. And the last time it was taught was about 12, 13 years in the church. It's an important letter for us to realize that you and I are not, no way, in shape or form, not susceptible to falling into the same places that this church did. Because we fall out of love with Jesus Christ. It really is. At the core root of it, what happened to Ephesus? They left their first love. It keeps on coming back to that. What do I love? Who do I love? And the introduction of this book tells me that the people that are there House of Chloe, they've sent something. He's already sent a note back saying, get out of that mess because fornication is obviously just a turning your back on God for sexual pleasures. And now you've got, whoa. This end of the chapter says in verse number 17, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaicus for that which was lacking on your part, they have supplied, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. As I write this letter, and they're back, that means they came to me, did some work in edifying and encouraging. Now they mutually did that. He, they go back, he writes the letter and says, I want to acknowledge that their visit to me really spurred me on. To write this letter. I've got to do something about this church that I love because I was there for 18 months. Would we see someone come to Christ and then not care about them anymore? Would we see a church get birthed and say, ah, they're on their own now. I hope they can make it. And if they don't, pfft, who cares? Oh, my. And then back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 for a moment. Just for a moment. An introduction to our series, Love Never Fails. You see, God called a man. He sent him two men. Then God used the circumstances of everyday life to touch lives. When you read some of the stuff in this chapter 13, people say, well, just leave it for the weddings and don't say it any other times. Well, that's not very often. And when you read it at a wedding, the husband and wife are going, I love him so much, I love him so much. You're not even paying attention to who we're talking about here. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about that charity from the divine. And when you look at the power of all of this, you say, wow. There's a lot here. I just want to reiterate something as I tie this together. I want to blend it together for, for time in the second message. Just go ahead and go to the next slide there for me, B, and just leave that love never fails up there. I just want to point out a couple things, and then I'm going to go right to my last three things and be done. Here we go. Verse number one, verse number two, verse number three. I'm going to read them, and I want you just to hear a little bit of language here that's going to come together for just a couple of highlights. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I want everybody to say it with me. I am nothing. That's one of those things where you stop and go, whoa. 
if I don't have any of those things right there, if I don't have, I mean, if I have all those things and I don't have charity, I that'll buckle your knees. What kind of love do I carry around for people? The love that looks at other people and expects them to love me the way I think they should, but rather choose not to love them the way God loves me? I'm breathing right now because he said I could breathe. I am standing here because he gave me the ability to do it. He can knock me over right now. And it would still be because he loves me. He sent his son for me. He has held on to me. He has cared for me and loved me. And yet, I think that I need to get better prophecies. I need to get more knowledge. I need to have faith so I can move every mountain. And if I could and I didn't have charity, I would have nothing. And I would be nothing. Is faith important? Oh, yes. Is doing those things for other people important? Well, yeah, look at verse number three. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I would sacrifice my life for yours. But if I have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Whoa. 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 B, if you would advance to the verse, I mean to the slide that I'm thinking of, which would be where it says, we, keep on going, keep on going, you're doing awesome, keep on going, we're going to speed read, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, look how fast you are, you guys are good readers, keep on going, you're doing great, one more, bam, we just covered 13 verses in 11 seconds, because <laughs> we've been reading them. You see, this letter moves into a place of study and teaching for us. And what it tells me is we are nothing without love. Not the love that, oh, I love you. No, it's his love. If I don't have this charity, this agape, then all the stuff that I'm doing for people, I'll give my life up for you, Trey. But I don't really love you. I just want everybody to hear that I did it for you. We've been doing that a lot in church culture for a long time. God forgive us. God looks on my heart and he knows what I'm all about. And he knows the rottenness of me. And yet he still says, Mark, I'll give you another day to know my Savior, to know my Son, to know the Lord, and to know his love. Because greater love hath no man than this. I would rather leave this earth having people know I loved more than I knew the Bible like everybody would want me to know the Bible. But they're interchanged because I cannot know his love without knowing his word. Surprise. It's interchangeable. But knowledge puffeth up. Charity edifieth. I don't need to have to be the most important person in the conversation. I did that to someone yesterday. I feel like such a... Oh, God. We do that stuff all the time. We are nothing without love. The second one says this. We make no profit without love. All the things you do that you think are going to profit something, there's no profit in them without love. Without this agape love from God that comes from him, neither death nor life nor angels, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Bam, there it is. Everything will fail, but his love will not fail. You see, when I look at all these and I see them and I read them through and I go, wow, they really strike. We are nothing without love. We make no profit without love. And you know what? The last one is verse number 13. 
we hear the greatest is love. Why did you put that up here? Let me read it to you so you can hear it. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The greatest is this agape love. The greatest is this benevolent love. This love that never fails. Having a Christ-like life, a love, charity, it's more important than knowledge. It's more important than faith. It's more important than gifts. It's more important than wisdom. It's more important than discernment. It's more important than everything. Charity is the bond of perfectness, it says in the scriptures. It is everything to God. Because it's proof that you love him first. So that you can then love others as yourself. As we talk around the office a lot, interject, a lot of us will say, love others. Just love people as yourself. Don't leave those two statements, those two words off. Because we love ourselves sometimes way too much. You say, I don't love myself. I have an awful time with loving myself. I get it. I understand. This world is beating the snot out of you to make you believe things that are not true. If you're a child of God today, he loves you, and I promise you, he'll take care of you. You just need to let him do that. It is the unity principle. It is the bond. Charity is the glue that holds us all together. It is the glue that holds the family, the church, the marriages, everything. And when we lose that, we lose it all. And we'll be standing there, the judgment seat of Christ going, man, I memorized everything. And he'll say, did you love like I loved? Did you love like my son loved? Because see, I expected that out of you because I put it in the Bible. When it really comes down to it, sometimes I approach this by just saying, you know, this is what I think about sometimes, and maybe I'll live it this way someday. <laughs> I keep on expecting myself to be that way, but since I'm not perfect, I give myself a Pasadena. Our question as we finish up is this. God's agape love never, never fails. Have we forgotten its power? Because that love is so powerful that it'll have you see things in Christ that only the world, the world only sees is devastation and desolation. You'll look at someone and you'll see hope. You'll look at someone and say, oh, I see a beautiful light for you. You'll see someone and say, you're a miracle of God. You'll see someone and say, wow, there's, it's going to be all right. And you're going to mean it. You'll see someone then and say, you need Jesus. You need to be saved. If you will, would you please close your eyes for a word of prayer, and I'll finish up our message today. When you bow your heads, I, I have the song playing in the background, nice and soft for you. I'm going to pray for you, but I want you just to kind of comprehend this simple statement. God's agape love never fails. Sometimes we have just forgotten his power and forgotten the power of his love. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Maybe here today and you've never experienced the love of God through Jesus Christ. You've never been born again. The Bible says you can know that love. You can know him and the power of his resurrection by turning your life over to him and calling on the name of the Lord to save you just like these three that have been baptized today. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Maybe today is the day you'd love to do that. I'll tell you what. It's a crowded room, and I understand, but God may be speaking to your heart right now. God really is speaking to you, and you're convicted that you're lost, that you've never known the love of God through Jesus Christ. I will stay up here after service. You can wait, and I'll talk to you personally. I have other pastors here. They'll wait. They'll stay here after service. They'll talk to you confidentially. Two of you, three of you, four of you. That's okay. We'll stay here. We've got nowhere to go. And for those of you that are born again, that have lost track of the power of his love, I pray today will be a renewal for you to commit and not forget. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this time in your word. 
your love never fails. Charity suffereth long. Charity is beautiful, and I love you for it. And as I'm praying to finish out and to have a little time of prayer with these people, I pray it work on their hearts, their souls, their minds. This is such an important moment. Please, God, have your way in Jesus' name. Please.